Our focus has been over the years dominantly on tall, major urban buildings and finding a way for those buildings to create sort of a social interaction within the place that they're positioned is fundamental. The intention is to be able to try to draw from the place the specific language that seems to feel most comfortable within that particular place. And that's why I call my book Gesture and Response. The gesture is made by the site, not by the building. The, the response is made by the building to the gesture of the site. And so while I'll do it in one way and one of my other partners will do it in another way, we're both doing essentially the same thing. It's just that it's a, a different way of looking at architecture. William Pedersen of KPF, you have to tell me the story more about hockey because when we were first uh, chatting off camera here, uh, the, the way that you started is you said, I went to school to go play hockey, not to go study architecture. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Well, I did. I, 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 I went to a tiny little boys school in St. Paul called St. Paul Academy. And we graduated 18 in our class. And of the 18, 15 of them went to Eastern Ivy League schools. And the three of us uh, re remained in Minnesota. Uh, and at that time, uh, the big local hockey powerhouse was St. Paul Johnson. And we played St. Paul Johnson when I was a junior in high school, and we lost to them 16 to 1. Ooh. Well, Herb Brooks scored six goals. <laughs> so when Herb Brooks, who was, of course, the coach of the 1980. Miracle on Ice, when he was fetted at the White House, one of my friends who was a journalist and became a journalist went up to him. He was also on my hockey team and introduced himself. And the first thing Herb said, after all, everything that had been happening to him in those, those months, he said, we beat you 16 to one. And I <laughs> <laughs> That's what he remembered. Huh? <laughs> yeah. At any rate, I, I went to Minnesota to get on that Minnesota team to prove something. And I beat out a lot of those guys that played for St. Paul Jets. And Herb Brooks was my roommate on the road. So, oh, I love it. I love I, it. I was very proud of that. Was he, was he like they made him out to be? Was he uh, as eccentric and as... Uh... Um, he just had his own style is kind of what I gathered. I've, I've, I've seen the movie that the, the Disney movie they made in 2006. I've watched some documentaries on it and, you know, done a little bit of studying, but w was he that type of person? Well, he was, a, he, Herb was a great guy, but he was sort of a loner and uh, he was very principled. Uh, and one of the things about Herb as a player, he always shot high. He, he could never keep the puck on the ice. He always shot it over the <laughs> over the upper right-hand corner, you know, and uh, Mariucci got a little frustrated with that at, at times. But, uh, you know, Herb was a great psychologist, and uh, he uh, was an also a very good student at, at the university. And, and uh, so, uh, what can I say? He, uh, he and I just sort of took very divergent paths. Yeah. So, so you went to the University of Minnesota, you played hockey, and then... Did you fall backwards into architecture? Was it something that you kind of knew and, and had a passion for, or was it something that you found there at school? Well, uh, <laughs> I, uh, I registered uh, at the University of Minnesota uh, in the Institute of Technology. And the School of Architecture was in the Institute of Technology, but the first year was spent, everybody did took this, the common subjects, everybody in the Institute. And that year I was on the freshman team. And fortunately I'd had a good education in high school and I was able to get through most of my courses without too much effort. And, but I put a hell of a lot of effort in the hockey team and they discovered that I wasn't as fast as they'd like me to be. So they wanted to put me on defense. And so to, to get me ready for defense, I would practice with the, vars with the freshmen from about two to three and then from the varsity from three to five or three or and, you know, it was a pretty active uh, practice schedule. Yeah. I uh, did a lot, of time, a lot of time for study. Well, I made the team my sophomore year, started when I uh, on defense. And then my first architectural project was due because our second year we started architecture. 
And uh, that was sort of the end of things. I just <laughs> off. After, after having stayed up all night for three nights in a row, um, I played, I, I don't know, North Dakota, I guess, and played badly. And Johnny Murray, you grabbed me and said, Peterson, take a rest. And uh, essentially, I've been resting ever since. So. <laughs> gotcha. So architecture yeah. one, huh? And so I, I know that took you on a career, uh, you know, getting licensed, becoming a designer, and then eventually uh, co-founding uh, KPF, right? The the firm that uh, that you are known for. And and can you talk a little bit about that? I know it's mentioned in the beginning of your book uh, and just the partnerships that that you had there and kind of the the formation and, and what needed to happen to start that firm. Well, let me let me talk a little bit about what led up to it because. Uh, at the beginning uh, of my architecture uh, studies, uh, I was not a good student. Uh, I really, I really didn't understand. I, I just, it just uh, for me, uh, I got a very slow start. And anything you don't understand, you don't particularly like. You know? So it was a very rough beginning. And I even consider after my third, or second year in design, I considered leaving to go into American studies with a friend of mine who did. Uh, but I, at the last moment, I, I changed my mind and, and stuck it out. And just at that time, uh, one of the professors sort of took an interest in me. And I started to catch on. Uh, but a year or two later, um, the big breakthrough took place when I started to work with Leonard Parker, who was a very fine architect who had been in the Sarnan office for many years. And I worked with him uh, for a, about six months. Uh, while I was in school and during the summer, and I, it just transformed me as, a, as an architect. I had a great year my last year and uh, then worked for him for another year and then went off to MIT. And from, from then on, uh, it, uh, you know, everything was, uh, I shouldn't say easier because it's never easy, but it, 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 was, it, it was more understandable. And I won the Rome Prize and I won the Rome Prize with Ian Pei on the jury went to work with I.M. Pei afterwards because he wanted me to come to work for him. I worked on the National Gallery for most of the time I was there. I was a senior designer on the National Gallery. And uh, working with I.M. showed me a method of working that um, I ultimately ended up employing the rest of my life, uh, architectural life. I, I am set a very clear direction. There's no doubt about the fact that the building was I.M.'s building. Mm -hmm. But from that point on, he wanted people to contribute to it. And he wanted people to, if they had an idea, if they had something they felt strongly about, he wanted people to express it. Mm. And as a result, if the idea was good, he would accept it. And there was, there's a lot of me in the National Gallery. Mm. And there's a lot of other people as, as, as well. And I am, did that with all of his buildings. And yet he produced a whole body of work, which is very definitely his body of work. There's no right. question. But it, 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 was a, it was a method of working which, you know, energized people. You didn't feel subjugated. You felt like you were energized. And so that's when I started by, through the firm, Gene, Gene Cohn, who had been president of Warnicke's office in New York, already a well-established architect, eight years my senior, uh, heard about me and to, uh, recruited me to come over to the Warnicke office um, where I had the opportunity to do buildings on my own. Uh, and so right from the beginning, uh, at that point, I met a young uh, a Chinese immigrant son named William Louis, uh, who has be become a very close friend. And we, we worked together for 50 years. He was working with me on my first project. Uh, and he hadn't even gone to architecture school yet. He was, he was still at the beginning of the thing. So it was a great time. And uh, there was a bit, tremendous lull in the architecture profession about the 1975, 1976, huge amount of unemployment, more so than we've experienced since. We had no, no way alternative other than to start an office. <laughs> <laughs> out of necessity. Out of necessity. And, and uh, you know, Gene is uh, an absolutely remarkable guy. He was a designer himself, but he's incredibly entrepreneurial. And then uh, we also joined with Shelley Fox. Sheldon Fox, who passed away about eight years ago. 
Shelley, uh, is, uh, look, I could compare the three of us <laughs> to the components of a sailboat because I do a lot of sailing. Okay. And uh, Shelley was definitely the keel. He, he kept, you know, he kept us uh, afloat in a way. And Gene and I, whether we're there, the, the, the sails or the hull or the, or the rudder, <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's somewhat ambiguous, but the three of us did not get uh, in each other's way. Mm -hmm. The three of us allowed each of us to basically operate um, fully within our sphere of responsibility. And that is what is, I think, not unique about KPF, but that certainly was one of the most important characteristics to our evolution. Right. Is it, Gene did Gene's thing superbly. I did my thing well. And Shelley, who was in a position, because he was sort of the financial manager of the office, he was in a position to say to me, you know, you're taking too much time working on these projects. We've got, we've got to do these things faster. We've got to somehow trim them down. Over 25 years, Shelley never once said that. Really? And, and we spent a lot of time on our projects. We, you know, did not, we weren't as profitable as we could have been uh, at the time, but he was very much committed to doing quality architecture and he knew that it took time. And so he enabled us to take the time. And, uh, you know, in, in, after it's all said and done, that sort of role tends to be a little bit, you know, uh, forgotten. Right. Um, but, uh, we just had a, an event at Jean's house the other day, and Shelley's widow was there, uh, and it gave me her uh, Judy Fox, and gave me the opportunity to be able to tell people about it because you know people in our office now who are partners have never met Shelley Fox and never knew anything about it. Uh, but without without the role he played, uh, we wouldn't be who we are. That's so cool. On that note, a little bit, can you talk about the project types that? I think you you kind of became famous for, or at least was a big focus uh, when you started the firm, which were high rise buildings, right? Skyscrapers. And when we were talking a little bit off camera, I think you mentioned that there was a bit of a per perception problem around that type of building at the time. And it was viewed as maybe kind of this utilitarian type uh, project. And I think you guys changed that a little bit, right? Well, uh, thank you for remembering that because, uh, you know, we, uh, we started, we got a couple of commissions at the be beginning, which uh, helped us get off the ground. And we didn't even have business cards when we started, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. We got high rise in Lexington, Kentucky, which I don't talk much about, but it, it, it nevertheless it helped get us started. And, and then we got this job in Chicago uh, on 333 Wacker Drive. And it was one of those opportunities which seemed from a design perspective to be completely obvious. And we were at the bend of the Chicago River. We had the opportunity of creating a relationship to that bend of the river. Everything about it enabled the building to, to sort of fit its site perfectly. Uh, it was very successful, it won almost every award that, that achievable. And it launched us. I mean, we, we became we became known as a result of that that building, and so thinking about it, started focusing on the high rise commercial speculative office building uh, seemed to us to be a, a very noble uh, prospect because our cities are built of these buildings and they're often very poorly designed. And they need to be considered as genuine subjects for the artistic merits of the architectural profession, which, in frank, frankly, they were not. Mm -hmm. They were considered, you know, sort of speculative buildings working in commercial architecture as, as a sort of second class of architecture. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't look at it that way. Obviously, we couldn't. We, we had to. <laughs> right. We had to I, and uh, but eventually, you know, uh, uh, Philip Johnson did a very interesting building down in Houston, and uh, 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 Norman Foster did some interesting buildings. And gradually, the, 
the tall building became a much more interesting subject artistically uh, than uh, Louis, Kahn, or Louis Sullivan wrote a book called, say, called The Tall Building Architectural, Ar Artistically Considered. And uh, that is essentially what we've been trying to do. To, to, but thinking of it artistically as in a way to create a, a sense of community, a sense of conversation with the buildings that are adjacent to it and that part of the city that it occupies. Our office is known as an office. It really builds well. Right. It really puts the buildings together with a great deal of care. One may like or not like the buildings themselves, but every one of them is really carefully, carefully constructed. There right. no, there's no A list or a B list. Every building is given exactly the same amount of effort. Right. I love it. So the, the title of your book is Gesture and Response. And I know that that is a phrase that means a lot to you. And I know that you've put a lot of time and effort into that. Can you explain a little bit about gesture as a response as a kind of a philosophy? Well, a gesture made in an urban building uh, is going to be very gesture, uh, different than a gesture made, for example, my house made it on the edge of the uh, the water here on an interesting site. Um, the interest in designing the house was to find a way for it to grow out of the land so it always became organically, very much in a Wrightian way, Frank Lloyd Wrightian way, mm -hmm. uh, a, a, a continuation of the landscape. When you build a tall building, and a very tall building, let's take the Shanghai World Financial Center, I saw that building as being a connection between the earth and sky. And the, the whole symbolism of the manner in which the building connected to the earth and the manner in which it connected to the sky was based on a sort of archaeological, <laughs> archaeological expressions of earth and sky that the ancient, Ch ancient Chinese had in fact uh, placed within their burial tombs. Mm. And the earth was always represented as a square uh, a, a cylinder, not cylinder, a square prism, and of a dark stone horizontally striding, whereas the sky was represented by a circular sort of onyx colored disc with a, a hole in the center. So you had immediately the opposition between the, fl the fluidity and, and, uh, of the, and lightness of the, the piece of representing the sky and the weightiness and the heaviness of the thing right connecting to the earth. The building itself became, frankly, an essay on how to make the transition between those two conditions. And for, fortunately, what was uh, we had in our program two spatial types, one commercial office space and two hotel space. Hotel space basically requires a different type of shape to, for an efficient operation than does an office a floor plan. So the building translates its form from the efficiency of the commercial space at the base of it to the relative slenderness of the hotel floor plate on the top. And all of that is done with sort of a cosmic arc that has been cut, sort of in a cutting the, the square prism. Every opportunity to respond to the issue of gesture as a, in, in, uh, in response to the site that, is going to be a different one, and, and it's impossible to uh, to to make any specific uh, uh, rule about how one responds because everyone has to be done based on the specific condition. Yeah, I, I love that, and it actually fits. It dovetails well to something we were talking about at the very beginning, a little off camera, which was I I had mentioned that. Um, someone had brought to my attention who knew your firm well, that she was her opinion that KPF was so impressive because they didn't really have a specific style, right? A lot of firms are known for, I mean, we, we talked a little bit about a, a specific project type, but uh, a lot of firms are known for a specific style and you can just, you can see that and say, oh, I know, I know who did that. It sounds a little bit more like, you you're approaching each project differently and it, it needs to have this kind of gesture. You need to have a response to the specific gesture. Is that kind of 
Well, that's true. And also we have clients, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's true. They, they get a little bit of feedback from time to yeah, time, right? <laughs> these, clients, these clients have a point of view on the subject as well. Right. And, and so that's how I began uh, very early in my career working in what I call a comparative process. Mm -hmm. Because when you ask a client, what do they want? <laughs> you know, it's just like asking me, what are you going to design for me? I don't know. You know, I, I, I'm going to find out. Well, the client's going to find out too what, what they feel comfortable with. And so never do we, well, other than the very first time I presented a building on my own. Right. Uh, uh, never do we come to a client with a single solution. Right. I did, I did that once and I'll never do it again. <laughs> Mainly, it's not I'm trying to ask the client to design the building for me. That's not the point. The point is to be able to, one, search all the various possibilities, and that's a discipline in itself for the architect. Mm -hmm. But it also enables the client to sort of see something and understand something that they respond to. And it's not that they're going to be choosing from a Chinese menu. It's that they sort of reveal their their sensibilities at the same time we reveal ours. And as a result, it goes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, finally coming to a, a point where everybody is comfortable. Right. And, and it, but the role of the client uh, for us has been extremely important. And I know this is not supposed to be so artistically well considered. An artist is supposed to come in there and stand, you know, plant their flag. Uh, and, uh, and that's all well and good. And there's some people that can get away with that. And that's, and if they're good enough, I, I applaud it. But it's just not the way we worked. And it's not the reason that we frankly are enormously successful. <laughs> right. I, you know, it's funny that you say that because I have talked to a number of people who have said roughly the same thing in so many words. And if we, if I think about it on a spectrum of, the one side of the spectrum would be, it is completely, we're going to do exactly what the client wants us to do. We're going to let the client design the building. And, and in that sense, we're just, you know, we're the, the aggregators of this and we're producing the, the documents for it, but it's really the client's vision. And then on the other side of that completely is um, what I think of like a star architect who's got their style and they're going to, they're going to implant that kind of, like you said. Everybody I've talked to that's been incredibly successful in the business is it has to be somewhere in the middle, right? It can't be like either of those spectrums feel like they're they're just prone to failure, but it really is that kind of collaboration of, you know, kind of meet me in the middle, right? Well, yes, and, and I, I think that you know the client, particularly when you're dealing with speculative office buildings or any building type for that matter, I mean the client has a huge investment, right? And, and we have a huge responsibility to make that investment uh, right. uh, worthwhile for them. Uh, but I found that if going through the series of the initial options and the client looked, sort of became attracted to a scheme that I really didn't like, I would find a way of doing some more options. Right. <laughs> and getting, Finding ways of getting a scheme that they did like, but at the same time, I like too. Right. And that, that, so that's, that's really the, the difference between the two. Right, 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 right. Can you talk a little bit more about something you were mentioning earlier, which was um, being willing and open to ideas from everybody? Um, and I'm specifically thinking about this as, you know, I work a lot with the Architectural Foundation. And so we have a lot of younger students. And the feedback that I get from younger students sometimes is they get hired at a firm, they, they go finish their four-year degree, they, they're doing either an internship or, you know, working in a draft, as a drafts person entry level, and they're kind of put in the corner and said, here, this is what you do, put your head down and just work, right? You, you haven't kind of earned the right to give your opinion yet. And when you were talking earlier, it sounded like it was more of the opposite of that, which is I want to welcome all ideas. It doesn't really matter who it comes from. And as long as it's a good idea, right? We're not just taking anything here, but as long as it's a good idea, right? We'll, we'll factor it in. Can you talk a little yeah. bit more about that? Well, that, you know, I, I explained the example working with IMP. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, I had only had a couple of years of experience when I started working with IM, and IM was at the top of its game. You know, he was the top architect in the in the United States. And uh, now, it, all of this depends on the individual. You know, there, there are the individuals that have talent, and there are other individuals that think they have talent but <laughs> don't. And uh, it, it, all of this has to be dealt with. Uh, by the leader of the team in a way that, that, that uh, makes it work. Uh, the, the leader has to be able to set a direction that's clear, but at the same time has to be able to somehow encourage contributions to that direction. And it's, it's a manner of, of, of just the style within which one communicates with human beings, you know? Um, some, you know, some people are just, just by nature dismissive. Mm-hmm. And that uh, sort of, uh, Type, frankly, uh, oftentimes uh, produces some great buildings individually mm-hmm. and doesn't want to have other people participating. I mean, I use the example of Lou Kahn in my book where Lou Kahn had done a drawing and his father looked at the drawing and, and offered a little suggestion. The moment he put this suggestion down on Lou's drawing, Lou tore it up and said, it's not my drawing anymore. You know? mm. Well, Archi- that may be true of his architecture as well. That it was, had to be his mm-hmm. thought process that dominated everything, which is, uh, believe me, I am not in any way denigrating that because he produced some great results, mm-hmm. far greater than any that I've ever produced. But architecture, by and large, it has, I don't know, maybe we have a, a handful of geniuses in our profession, just a handful. Mm-hmm. The rest of us have to find a way of doing good architecture by a method which enables others to contribute to it so that we can get it better and better and better. It may not be the greatest, but it it, it get it is it's improved by the contribution of others and the attitude one has towards their contribution. And that's why, uh, no, young people, and particularly now with Zoom, frankly, don't get pushed off in the corner anymore. We've got young people in their first year with us that are making presentations over mm. Zoom for our nine offices, you know, and it is, it is sort of in many respects now almost a golden age for people to begin in architecture. There's so many tools to work with now that we didn't have before. And it's, it's uh, in, a, in a way, uh, an entirely new world. Right. Even even since <laughs> I, I've not been really active for the last six years. Right. And during the last six years, so much has changed in our profession. And that it, it actually leads us into our last question here, which is a great one, which is, you know, we always like to end these with um, what is the best advice that you could give to a young up and coming design professional? And, and what you just said triggered in the back of my head, which is the, the industry has changed significantly over your career, but even just in the last, you know, five plus years, even the last 18 months or so that, you know, we've been in, uh, in kind of a, a quarantine COVID world. Is there any advice that you can think of that would be kind of timeless advice? It doesn't matter if you were designing in the seventies or if you're designing, you know, now in the, in the, the 2020s, um, any any piece of advice or or thought that you could give to a young up and coming designer? Yeah, well, you have to love what you're doing, and no matter what one does, one has to really love what one's doing. And, and frankly, you know, I could not consider myself doing anything other than what I've done for the rest of my life. I just I couldn't possibly do it. I I love what I do so much, and by and large, those people that are successful within our profession or any profession are those that really, you know, uh, can't help themselves. They just love it so much. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so finding that, you know, is, is not that easy because you don't always find it at the beginning. Right. You know, I, I was very frustrated at the beginning and, and uh, I was very fortunate to have found it. And once having found it, you know, it, it has a momentum all of its own, but you know, it, for those that, don't find it right away and, and give it some time. But if you don't find it, get out of it. And right. they, they say that about musicians too. I mean, yeah. if, you, if a musician doesn't love you know, practicing and love, love them, you know, it's just too damn difficult. Right. And it, it, you've got to love it. So, oh. uh, 
<laughs> that's great. Honestly, that's beautiful advice. And I think it's more true now than ever before because students today have more options now than ever before. Thank right. You. As so many options with Zoom and, and the internet and, and you know, it used to be if you were, um, you know, in Kansas City, Missouri, and you wanted to be a designer, there were like three places to go, right? It wasn't, you know, now, I mean, the, the world is your oyster, but with that becomes this, this great responsibility to find something that's fulfilling. And I love, I'm going to loop it back to your hockey story, which was when, when you were competing, when architecture and hockey were competing, it wasn't really that big a competition, right? It was like, it was just a very, it was a very, uh, you know, easy choice to make. So. Well, back in those days, it was survival. I mean, I, I really do. When I look back, I really do regret having to commit uh, not to, to be able to continue my hockey career because yeah. I loved it. Yeah. But that's for that love. I had a passion for hockey. Yeah. And I transferred that passion in, into my profession. And, right. uh, so <laughs> that's, it, I love right. it. I love it. Well, William, that's a great place for us to leave it. Thank you so much for your time today and your wisdom. This was excellent. Really appreciate it. If you haven't checked it out yet, go check out William's book, Gesture and Response. Um, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. It was great. I enjoyed talking with you. 